How's it going? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Ben. As I said, uh, uh, pleasure to come talk to you today about some of the stuff I've been doing in, in urban planning and data and, and government and things like that. Um, really short, I guess I would call myself a, a data storyteller. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, if you asked me a little while ago what a data storyteller was, like a year and a half ago, I'd say I really don't know. But um, what's happened is uh, I've worked for an uh, investment management firm called Two Sigma. Uh, we look at data and we try to predict uh, the future of sort of where markets go. And, um, and, and through my skills I've learned there, I've become this data storyteller thing. And so, you know, as I said, I've got this one career. And on the other hand, I married this urban planner, uh, my wife, Leslie. And she brought me into this world of urban planning. She went and took the statistics class at Pratt. But the class wasn't that exciting. You know, statistics classes are generally not. And she'd come up, why do I have to learn this? And, I, would, and I'd find, I'd, I kept listening to this, and I said, you know, this is silly. We have all this New York City data coming out, like, in real time, all over the world. We have all this data. Why are we teaching students from a textbook of made-up problems when we can have them study their own city? So I went to Pratt, and I said, hey, um, I'd, love to, I'd love to sort of run the statistics class. Uh, can, I, can I have a go at teaching it? And I started doing that. Um, but there's something that happened before that that made this all possible. And that's, in New York City, we had the open data laws, all right? Bloomberg, in 2012, signed legislation that required city agencies to release data instead of just give us like plots and charts and graphs and figures and infographics, which is what they used to do. Uh, now they give us access to the underlying data below all these charts and plots. Um, when Ms. when uh, Mayor Bloomberg put this out, he said, look, across city, agencies are using more and more data to develop policies, implement programs, and track performance. Each month, our administration shares more and more of this data with the public at large, catalyzing the creativity, intellect, and enterprising spirit of computer programmers to build tools to help us all improve our lives. This is the 2012 Bloomberg view of open data. And sure enough, the city has invested in these big app competitions, because what is more data than apps, right? App, 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 app. And the city keeps pouring money in the big apps competition, and it's a great, it's really cool. There's really cool apps that come out of it. But it kind of misses the point of, of open data, so much so. Um, if you look at what he said, he said, look, open data is about computer programmers. And I'm like, no, 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 it's not about computer programmers. It's so much bigger than that. It's about all of us. It's about urban planners. It's about um, you know, policymakers, nonprofits, anyone. And as our tools get better, we'll actually have access to use this data to tell the stories that we all want to do. So whereas the city kind of thought it was open data goes to apps, and then apps goes to the world, I think it's much more direct input into all this data. And we're starting to see more and more of that. Today, the open data portal looks like this. Uh, you go to it, and it's you know, not very exciting. But underneath are 1,200 data sets uh, in New York City. The state runs a portal. The federal government has, of course, data.gov. Cities, uh, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of cities in the United States all are starting to get on board. Um, and there's something called the Open Data Census. If you want to play, go to the Open Data Census. You can Google it. Uh, type in your city. You'll see a list and ranked list of, of, of uh, cities across the world. And then uh, up and down are the cities. Left and right are types of data. And they tell you, is it downloadable? Is it in raw format? Or is it on a silly map that you can't analyze? Um, and things like that. So um, before in the old world, the Taxi and Limousine Commission in New York would put out plots like this. How many for hire vehicles do we have? How many taxis do we have? And that's what, and, you know, somebody somewhere ran some query and they'd walk and put out this plot and it'd be on the cover of, you know, nyc.gov and we'd all go home happy. But the thing is, there are so many more questions we can ask about taxis than how many we have. And how can the city know how many questions we all have, right? We have infinite numbers of questions. With open data, let's ask our own questions. I was curious, when is rush hour in New York City? And luckily, all the cabs have GPS recorders, so they drive around and record their speed. You know, the time they picked up a passenger, the time they dropped off a passenger, how long it took, distance equals rate times time, we get average speed. So I plotted the average speed of New York City cabs to try to investigate when rush hour is in New York City. I found that at 5.18 in the morning, they're at their fastest speed. They're going 24 miles an hour, and then things go south very quickly, down to 11 and a half miles an hour by 8.30. And it turns out there's no rush hour in New York, there's just a rush day. It stays, six, it stays at 11 half miles an hour the entire day. But I couldn't only ask this because of open data, right? Uh, technically, this was FOIL data. Someone had to uh, put out a Freedom of Information Law request. Whole another talk for a whole another day. Last week, New York City, under a lot of pressure over the last, including a, uh, a talk on this, and uh, uh, put out for the first time trip level data themselves. So instead of having us all FOIL data over and over and over again, have a poor guy at the agency copy, they have you bring a hard drive down like, every day. It was crazy. They finally posted it last week. So we're making inroads. So what happens when we take data science and urban planning? Well, I taught this class. The things in the class were fun, so I made this blog. Started writing the blog. One of the first things I did was made this map. This is a map of cyclist collisions in New York City. This is where cyclists are getting into accidents. You know, it's pretty, uh, there's all this red area. I don't, by the way, I'm not a designer. My maps are, are eh, but uh, I do my best. I think this was through a program called QGIS, which is a spatial software for planners. They, they all know GIS software. I really went to like file, save as, heat map. I'm like, that was it. It wasn't really 
analysis, so to say. But that didn't stop it from interesting people, right? I put this on the web. It was me learning how to use QGIS. And suddenly, and by the way, uh, Williamsburg and Roosevelt Avenue and Queens, these are all hot spots that we learned from, from this. And, and when I put it on the web to see what happens, things started covering it, right? Gothamist, which covers kind of all sorts of things, wrote about this. And then it suddenly was on, someone said that I pegged a, a Broadway stretch of Williamsburg as a death trap. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, another article said, Killingsburg, like Wellington. The New York Post called it a study. I was like, it's not a study, it's a blog post. Things got kind of out of control. And it was in the Atlantic, and I'm sitting there going, why are this, is, I, didn't, I went to file, save as. Why are things going, what is going on here? There's such a hunger for data. Why are people following these data posts? So I realized there's a third leg to all this stuff. It wasn't just the urban planning and the data science. It was really a third thing I do, which is improv and improv comedy. Why do I say that? Because storytelling is so important in data science. Our science curriculum in the United States, we don't really do, you know, you know, we don't cover storytelling. We don't really do communication. But if you can only talk to other scientists about what you do, right, if your data blog is all about data and the Python and the Perl and the stuff that you download and no one cares <laughs> except for people like us. But if you can communicate with the public, your message gets farther out. So I started to say, well, what does improv comedy have in common with data science and how can I leverage that? And that's why I call it data storytelling because there are these keys to storytelling with data. So one, I look to connect with people's experiences, right? I could write about something random or I could write about what people in New York I thought think about. So I'm walking around New York and I was like, there's a lot of Starbucks here. And then I was like, well, I wonder who lives farthest from a Starbucks in New York City. So I made this map of New York, which is just uh, uh, the, dis the Starbucks distance. I found out that half of New York was within, within three blocks of Manhattan, excuse me, was in three blocks of a Starbucks, which is pretty phenomenal. But I also found the person who lived farthest from a Starbucks in Inwood, up, up in the little star in the north. Kind of useless. Some things are more, are more useful, though. So in New York, we have this problem during rush hour, the evening rush, where taxis all disappear during the evening rush, which is kind of silly, right? Why? Because it turns out that if you, if you plot, by the way, the income, the dollars made per uh, minute of the entire New York City taxi fleet, you get a plot that looks like this throughout the day. See that big dip there? That is, the, that is around 4 to 5 p.m. So suddenly during rush hour, New York City taxis make all this less money. It's really crazy, and it's been confounding New York City for decades. Ed Koch, the old mayor, was complaining about this. This is just a known problem. Why? Because New York City has, uh, uh, has two shifts for every, legislatively has two shifts for every cab, okay? And guess when the optimal time for me to hand in over the keys to the other person is? So that we both make equal amounts of money, right? There's only one time in the day where a 12-hour shift, previous 12 hours, is equal to the sum of the next 12 hours. And that happens to fall right around rush hour in the evening. Now, this is not globally optimal, right? The entire fleet would make more money if we switched at 2 p.m., but then the late person was going to get more money, and that would be unfair. It's kind of a game theory problem. Um, so if I plotted, actually, the rolling 12-hour amount of money the fleet was making, and where they crossed means the previous 12-hour shift is making the same as the next 12-hour shift, and sure enough, right during the evening rush hour. Um, pretty interesting stuff. In fact, the city put a rush hour surcharge trying to fix this. They said, let's throw more money at it. We're going to add more money at rush hour in the evening, supply and demand, we're good, right? The problem is all that money went to the late driver. And the early driver's like, this is ridiculous. Why do you get more money? I want more money. Let's hand it over later in the day. <laughs> and so the entire equilibrium point actually shifts later into rush hour, causing even more problems, which I don't think the city saw coming. But some simple uh, data analysis can kind of help start to tell these stories. So I had the pleasure, when I wrote about this, to go in and speak with the, uh, the commissioner of the Taxi Limousine Commission and, and, and propose an interesting solution, which is, um, uh, the idea that you charge rental fees at different amounts for each 12-hour shift. So what happens is the, the drivers are renting from a garage, and right now the city has a legislative cap, so you can only charge this much for your cab. So if I want to do an expensive shift and a cheap shift and have this guy make less money and this one make more money, I can't do that because legislation has it here. So we've kind of legislated ourselves into this mess. Uh, if they lift the cap and allow dynamic pricing, we can suddenly make a 12-hour shift that make less money, cost less to rent make equilibrium, then it doesn't matter when you shift. So that, that hopefully next year we'll have this problem uh, uh, solved. Another thing about data science and storytelling is not to make things too complicated. So you've, you've heard a lot today about complex things. And actually, you know, in my work at Two Sigma, we have all sorts of interesting predictive models and machine learning, and I have a background in natural language processing. I get it. But there's so much we can tell just about descriptive and simple things, right? And, and I like to focus on a single idea when telling a story in data. So here is a map of New York, and I looked at the gender of the city bike riders, our bike share system. We can see male versus female riders and whether there's a pattern in New York. And that star there is Times Square and Midtown where all the offices are. So what we're seeing is the riders on bikes in New York are predominantly, I think, 80 to 90% male around Midtown Manhattan, and only about 40% uh, male as we get out to Brooklyn. And this is interesting because the data set's kind of big and wheel has all these things, and we're just taking one column and telling a story of it. 
you can make visualizations that pop and bam and boom and do all this stuff, and it may be really cool and artsy, but I always try to find, if I look at a visualization and say, what have I learned from this? Is there a takeaway? And that's how I know whether I like my visualization or not. Um, along those lines, I like to not just focus on a single idea, but make that idea relatively simple when possible. Right? This whole Occam's razor, simplicity has its, has its purpose. Um, people hear that you're doing all this data and they assume there's things going on like this all the time. Um, and I'm always like, no, 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 it's, it's actually more like this. Um, and I, it struck me when I, I did uh, an analysis and um, uh, the, New, the New York Post, a reporter called, like, how did you do that? And I'm like, I counted. <laughs> and they're like, what is your, I'm like, no, I counted. Because really, a lot of this stuff is, can be somewhat simple. So I, I, I went into New York and I was curious where tourists go. And I said, well, how can we look at that? Well, we can look at parking tickets. And in fact, what if we look at the percent of parking tickets given to non-New Yorkers in every neighborhood? Right? And that's kind of, I mean, it's not a perfect indication of tourists, because it's not just tourists, but people working. And it's a mix. It's not great. But it's a start. So I mapped the percent in every neighborhood of tickets given to non-New York license plates. Um, and got this kind of map of New York, where really in Midtown, we have a big bright yellow. Lots of people visiting uh, uh, or, or coming to work there. We see kind of stretches. And then as we get farther out from the middle of New York, the percent of visitors goes down. So it starts to give us kind of an interesting proxy. The cool thing is you could do this with each state. So I looked at people from New Jersey, and they're typically coming into kind of Midtown to work. People from Connecticut are coming in from the north. And my favorite is people from California, because they only seem to get tickets in the hippest New York and Brooklyn neighborhoods of, of, uh, of Williamsburg and Greenpoint. And you can actually see it in the data. You can quantify how cool Californians are. Um, uh, and these are really like, you know, these are the core cool neighborhoods of New York. You can see it in parking ticket data, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm also a believer of exploring things that you, you understand, not just kind of, um, not just taking something random. There are some data, you know, I, I sometimes see these Kaggle competitions where they give you just a bunch of features and they're like, this is feature one, two, three, four, five, ten. You have to predict this and like, you, don't ha you have no context. That's driving me nuts. Uh, and I think having an understanding of what you're doing adds a lot of value. Um, and I keep that in mind as I, as I do stuff in New York too, um, because sometimes I'm following kind of intuitions I have. One of my favorites is I was walking through uh, Union Square and I don't know if you've ever seen these fast food restaurants that are combined. So sometimes there's a Taco Bell Sometimes there's a Pizza Hut, but I don't know if you've ever seen the Taco Bell Pizza Huts, right? They exist out there. Um, and, and Papa John's, like, you know, they have these combinations. And I was thinking to myself, these combinations look a little bit less clean than the, than the regular ones, just, from, you know, from instinct. So I went into the New York City health inspection data, and I took every paired restaurant and compared them to the individual restaurants, took the average health inspection scores, higher is worse, and, and found, actually, in fact, um, that, uh, like, for example, all the way on the left, you see Dunkin' Donuts on the left in blue. Baskin and Robbins in the right, and the combination was worse. And in fact, every combination restaurant did worse. The most extreme was Papa John's with an 18, Subway with a 15, and then Papa John's Subway's with a 28. And these are like violation points, adding one and two violations. These are averages. So we're starting to actually quantify these, these instincts you have uh, walking around New York. I also, out of curiosity, ranked all the fast food restaurants in New York from cleanest to dirtiest. You know, why not? Well, I was in there. It was fun. Um, and I found out that White Castle was the cleanest which was pretty crazy, and, and poor IHOP was, was, uh, scored the worst there. Um, uh, everything between the A and the B would be, would be a, a, I could probably visualize it better, but would be a B score in New York on average. And so most of them aren't doing that well. Um, it was funny is that White Castle responded to this news when it, when it made the press, and one of their, one, one of their uh, uh, vice presidents said, what, 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 one of the, I think, for not very progressive statement, but White Castle Vice President Richardson said, he wasn't surprised the chain led to the pack. If you've got time to lean, you've got time to clean. And I was like, I don't want to work there. That sounds, that sounds rough. Um, IHOP was like, yeah, we had our problems a while ago. We fixed it. His data had five years. You know, his data was looking at five years. If you only looked at two years, we'd do fine. That was IHOP's statement, which I also thought was pretty funny. Um, so let's say you do all this. In the end, you know, your goal is to, is to make, make an impact with data. And part of that is getting your story out um, and explaining it in a way that people can understand. And, and that's so important, right? Um, and, and as we heard in prior talks, there's, there are lots of ways to measure your impact. One thing I've looked at is looking for ways to kind of prod the city to start to change city life in New York. And they, they make up little things. So for example, if you've ever ridden the, the, the New York City subway system, you're, you're greeted with this beautiful machine, where um, they ask that you go to buy a Metro card, which is our subway fare system, and they say, how much do you want to spend on this card? How much do you want to put on? You want to put $9, 19 or 39 This is from last year. Now, rides are $250. Um, and, uh, the thing is, when you buy these things, you also get a, I forget what the percent is at the time, but uh, I think it's a 5% bonus. So you say I want $9, but you really pay $9, and then you get $9 and like 45 cents, right? So there's these bonuses, these amounts. Um, and the weird thing is, I did a proof, and, I, and I'd always ride the subway, and I never had zero balance. 
I used these buttons. I, I was like, what's going on? So I did a mathematical proof showing that you can never get a zero balance using their buttons and riding the subway. That it was like mathematically impossible. And when they expire, the MTA was taking in tens of millions of dollars a year in credit left over on Metro cards. So, you know, so I wrote about this. Um, and I, I don't know if they were thrilled, but they, the MTA responded and they said, these machines do not hold an infinite amount of change. Denominators are suggested to ensure there's ample change to accommodate customers who pay with cash. That being said, we will certainly look at this as part of the process involved in rolling out the next scheduled fare increase. Thank you so much, MTA. <laughs> they got me there, they got me there. Um, uh, so the fare increase comes and I'm like, all right, you know, I don't hear anything, what's gonna happen? So I go to the machine and something really cool happened. They added a new button <laughs> for me. Uh, there used to be, by the way, this is 9 19 and 39 because there's a $1 fee on your first card, so it's a $10 bill, a $20. Now there's this random one, $27.25. If you hit $27.25, I think you get exactly 11 rides and no more. So they've added a little button there to make an even number for, for, for me, I think, um, which is cool. The weird thing is that where else in the world do you go in somewhere and be like, um, hi, I have $4 to spend, you know, give me some apples. Like that's, you know, you say, I want two apples, how much does it cost? You cannot go into the New York City subway system and say, I would like to ride the train three times, how much will that be? Today, to this day, that is not the way the New York City subway system, it's unbelievable. Instead, it's like, here's the amount of money, thank you, here's a random amount of money, good luck. That is where we are today. So I'm not appeased by this button, but I'm pretty excited that I got a button added to the, to the vending machine using, using some math. Um, here's a, speaking of the health inspection scores, this is a distribution of scores in New York City. And what happens is our, all of our restaurants get A, B, and C grades depending on how many violations. These violations are one or two points. You know, you don't have a temperature set correctly in the fridge, your sink is too close to the soap, your, who knows, all sorts of problems. Um, and if you look, 13 is the most you can get and still get an A. And as soon as you go to 14, you get a B. So now, you'd think that the histogram of counts would be somewhat even. 13, 14, same, right? Absolutely not. What we're seeing is all this bunching on the boundary of A and B, right? So why is that happening, right? The inspectors are in a little bit of grade inflation, right? Ah, oh, you're a 13, I didn't see that cockroach, I didn't see that cockroach. Um, there's something very weird happening here, here in the city. Now, unfortunately, uh, I can't look at which inspector is doing this because they don't release the inspector name in the open data set, but there's certainly something funny going on. And you can see it in between B and C as well. It's very puzzling. I wrote about this and the Department of Health responded with this gem. Inspectors are not instructed to offer leniency, just to cite what they see. The final score is based on the extent of the violations the inspector observes. Thank you, Department of Health. Um, I guess I'll check that again in a few years and see if they made any changes in response. I don't know, it's a bit of a black hole. Um, I also noticed looking at taxi fare data that New York City cabs, when you ride in them, if you ever take any cab and you pay with credit card, at the very end they say, hey, would you like to tip 20, 25, or 30 percent? All right, and you, you know, most people are, in fact, more than half the people hit one of those buttons. Um, uh, I think 60 percent hit the 20 percent button. And but no one ever stops to think, well, 20% of what? You ever stop and think, what are you paying 20% on, right? It's kind of like when you're at a restaurant, do they add tax? So I, I was doing some analysis and I realized that half the cabs in New York, we had two vendors, one called Creative Mobile Technologies and one Verifone, they had two contracts. One was charging 20% on top of tolls and taxes and the fare and the surcharge. The other one was only doing it on top of the fare and the surcharge. So depending on the brand of the computer in the back of that cab, you'd be tipping more Depending, and like, as if a consumer should know that, right? I did the math, it was three to four hundred dollars more a year in salary for the drivers of the creative mobile technology cabs than the Verifone cabs, right? Um, which is crazy in such a highly regulated industry in New York. Everything is regulated down to the exact hue of the color and everything. Um, so I, when I wrote about that, the, t the Taxi and Limousine Commission responded, we appreciate that work that went into his analysis and we're giving it a thorough read. <laughs> um, but, sure enough, uh, uh, a few weeks later, in fact, they did reprogram half the cabs in New York. It didn't go exactly as I planned. They made half of them more expensive. <laughs> so now all cabs in New York will tip on top of tolls, but at least it's fair. I think what happened is that the, the, these, these systems are done by the vendors and then, um, and then the taxi driver is not gonna, you know, they're all gonna go for the better one, right? Make more money. And so the other one had to kind of, you know, I kind of caused this, this shift. But I do feel good that it's a little bit more transparent now. You don't have to think twice. Um, a few more examples. Uh, this is, by the way, on the back of every New York City police car over the last few months, we now have Twitter handles crazy. Every precinct now has a you know, Twitter handle. And so they're starting to use Twitter, which is great. And they do things like this. The fifth precinct had a 115% increase in bicycle collisions this year. Police officers will be enforcing violations by bicyclists. Hashtag bike space safety, uh, which is cool. And, then I, and I'm sitting there looking at this and I'm like, 115% increase in bicycle collisions. That's pretty dramatic. Like, it must be total carnage. Like, one day it's fine. Like, ah! 
So, but with open data, we can start to actually ask these questions. This is so cool. By the way, I've been challenging journalists as well when they write stories to release their raw data so we can all check. It's really cool when you get to start looking at what journalists do. Same with the city. Show your work, right? Where did this come from? So I wrote about that, and the New York Police Department said, no, they didn't say anything, unfortunately. <laughs> we never got to the bottom of that. Um, and and one, one last example uh, was, was exploring um, fire hydrants in New York. So I mapped hydrants, but these aren't just any hydrants. These are the top 250 revenue grossing hydrants in terms of parking ticket revenue. So when cars get within 15 feet of any of these hydrants, they ticket you, right? They're like little like Venus fly. And, and, uh, uh, and if you map the hydrants, you can see the Upper East Side of Manhattan is like crazy. They just love ticketing for fire hydrants. I don't know, that precinct probably gets a lot more revenue. But what was more fascinating in mapping these hydrants, by the way, this is just an aggregation, right? Like aggregate count. And these stories just pop out when you aggregate things. When you aggregate something, you look for an outlier, and there's a story when you start looking at municipal data. There's usually a story. Um, in this case, I found these two hydrants in the, in the Lower East Side that were together were making over $55,000 a year just being hydrants, just standing there as hydrants. More than minimum wage, just being hydrants. Um, it's fascinating. And, and you know, you start to look at this, and this is, you know, something that has been happening for five, six years. The revenue is, is quite substantial. Um, and if you, I went on to, uh, went and checked out the spot, and what you see is that there's a hydrant, and then what looks like a bike lane, and in New York, we have these separated bike lanes where you have, a, you, have, you, have a, you have the curb, then a bike lane, then the cars park, and then the street. So that way, the car park cars. So it's kind of one of those deals, except technically, it turns out it wasn't a bike lane. It was called the curb extension, which meant it was like a sidewalk extension, which you would never know because there are cyclists on it all day. Um, but you were supposed to know that. The Department of Transportation painted this lovely parking spot for cars to park there. The New York Police Department disagreed with this designation, and this went on for years. Um, by the way, the Google Street View car drove by and caught this parking ticket on the guy's windshield, which I appreciated that that was caught in, on Google Maps. Um, and there was actually a sign in Chinese, uh, this is near Chinatown, on the hydrant, hanging on a hanger that said, do not park here, but it was only in Chinese. So, uh, so I wrote about that, and the uh, um, Department of Transportation said, well, we, we have not received any complaints about this location. We'll review the roadway markings and make any appropriate alterations. And I said, okay, well, you know, we'll see what happens there. And amazingly enough, three weeks later, they came and they repainted the streets. Um, just from these small data discoveries, right? Hyperlocal. This is what open data allows. I don't expect them to sit and do this kind of work. They probably have a lot going on, you know, keeping the city running. But, you know, when you start to make observations locally with open data and a little bit of data science and a bit of, you know, even sim simple things like aggregating, you can start to tell stories and really make change happen because it's no longer, you're not just a crazy person complaining. You're a crazy person complaining with data, which is way better. <laughs> you get farther. Um, and, and so I've learned, you know, look, in the end, to, to, to make these changes, uh, I find it important. You want to connect with people, know your audience, right? Keep, simplicity is okay. There are things that need to be complex, but, there is, but don't always be scared away by the fact that everything needs to be so complex. Um, some problems call for it. Others, you can do really good things just with descriptive statistics, simple stuff, and start to really uh, tie, take apart uh, the stories hidden within data. Um, I'll, I'll point out that, uh, you know, for, for, I know that this is a data conference, so many of you probably have a lot of experience, but this is, just to give you an idea of the type of stuff that can be done very quickly now with open data, this is a view of, uh, of traffic collisions in New York from the open data portal. And in my second class with my urban planning students, um, uh, one of them who doesn't have any programming experience was able to use Excel and start to map out the way injuries are caused around the zip code around our university in, in a second class just using Excel, right? Using like pivot tables and all this such stuff. So this is not rocket, this is not rocket science. There's, there's really valuable stuff for all of us, not just for programmers. Um, and, and something like this, which is graffiti complaints, even a, a high schooler uh, uh, in, in something called the City Term, which was a high school visiting program in New York, made this map without any computer skills, <laughs> uh, drawing graffiti. So you can really, you can really kind of take data and run with it. So I guess in the end, I'd say anyone can be a data storyteller if they know how. Um, and if you're interested in, in following you know, my antics uh, around, around New York and working with agencies and, and really advocating for the release and, and, and less PDFs, more, uh, more raw data around New York City, uh, check out iQuant New York where, where I post and have a mailing list. And, and thank you so much. I'll open up the questions.